Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before opening tonight's file, it occurs to us that as you have listened to previous programs in this series, you may have wondered about the word society in the name Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Why is it called a society, you may have said to yourself? Why not a company? Well, the answer is very simple. The Equitable Society is called a society because it is a society. It is a voluntary association of men and women who have joined together for security. It is a cooperative enterprise maintained solely for the benefit of its members. And all its members receive the friendly service and personal attention that the word society implies. So when you next consider the purchase of life insurance, remember that by becoming an equitable society policyholder, you automatically become a member of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Cautious Killer. A crime of passion, such as killing in a rage of jealousy, is seldom committed by the hardened, cold-blooded professional criminal. It is more often the act of a normally law-abiding citizen, a store clerk or a banker or a doctor or a laborer, such as the coal miner in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. And because it is not a professional crime, its final solution may rest solely on getting a confession of guilt from the suspect. But many arduous steps between the start of the hunt and victory for the hunter. In most any small coal mining town, a pretty young woman storms out in sharp and refreshing relief against the dinginess of the community. And often she is the target for the idle gossip of the envious. In this particular mining village in Ohio, the pretty young woman was Mary Clifton, whose husband John always drank too much beer at the corner bar and sometimes got wind of too much gossip. Tonight, as usual, Mary has put supper in the warming oven while waiting for the sound of steps on the porch. Tonight, the steps are heavier than usual. Mary? Mary! I'm right here, John. Oh. Supper ready? Yes. Let me have your dinner pail, dear. I can take care of myself. And don't call me that. 
call you what? Dear. Let me have your dinner pail, dear. Supper's ready, dear. Wash up, dear. John, please. You know why I don't like the word? No. Because I know that's what you call him, too. Who are you talking about? You know who I'm talking about. He was here again today, wasn't he? Who do you mean? Jim by... Monroe. Yes, Jim is here. I knew it. He came to see you. Don't give me that. Everybody in town knows who he comes to see. John. He's in love with you. John, don't say that. Everybody in town is saying now, it. Now, look, you've been drinking. That's what you always say when I start talking about you and him. Please. You don't like to hear me talk about it, do you? But you like it when he comes here to see you. Stop it, John. You like it when he holds you in his arms and kisses you. I can't stand this. But you can't stand him loving you, can't you? Can't you? Thank you, John. Huh? Thank you for slapping me. Help me get hold of myself so I can tell you something. What? I'm leaving you. So I was right, Wait huh? a minute. Let me talk. When I married you, I loved you as much as any woman ever loved a man. But through the years, you've done everything possible to kill that love. And now that it's dead, things around me have begun to matter. All I can see is this, this dirt and this filth and this shabbiness. And I can't stand it anymore. Are you through? Yes, I am. Okay. Now let me tell you the real reason you want to leave. You want to go away with him? Think whatever you like, John. I'm leaving tonight. Oh, no, you're not leaving. You don't think I'm going to let you go away with him, do you? I said think whatever you like. Come back here. Take your hands off me. You ain't pulling any double cross on John, me. John, let go of me. John, John, you're choking me. This kind of spoils your plans, don't it? This kind of messes everything up for you and Jim. He can have you, all right? When I'm done with you... Sure. Now he can have you any time he wants. Exactly two weeks after the brutal slaying of the miner's wife, in the adjoining state of Pennsylvania, agent in charge Leeds of the Pittsburgh office of the FBI has just received a caller. Mr. Leeds? I'm Chief of Police Baxter from Larkin, Ohio. Oh, yes, yes, I've been expecting you. Sit down, won't you? Thanks, I will. <clears throat> I think I have a case for the FBI. Yes? Two weeks ago in Larkin, the house of a coal miner called John Clifton caught fire and burned to the ground. Mm-hmm. We found the charred body of Mary, the miner's wife, on the floor of what had been the kitchen. What about the husband? Well, he was drinking at a bar when the fire alarm was turned in. He ran to the fire and he tried to get his wife out, but the fireman stopped him. Where's the crime angle, Chief? Mr. Leeds, I don't think Mary Clifton died in that fire. Oh? I've got a suspicion that she was murdered before the fire. Murdered by her husband. Yes, but you just said that when the fire broke out, he ran to the house and attempted... I know, I know. I haven't got enough material evidence to back up my suspicions or I'd have him extradited. Extradited? Yes. That's why I came here. John Clifton left Larkin, Ohio a week after it happened. We traced him to Ridgewood, Pennsylvania. And he's working there in the coal mines. Chief, if you haven't enough evidence, I... I don't see where we fit in the case. We can back into the murder. You see, Clifton was jealous of a man named Monroe. He tried to extort money from Monroe on the grounds that he was carrying on with his wife. Hmm. I see. Now, let me give you the whole background on this fellow Clifton. Here's the reason why I think that... Did you want to see me, Mr. Lee? Yes, come in, Jeff. Thanks. Did you finish reading up on the Clifton case? Yes, I just finished. According to our vocation avocation file, you've spent some time around coal mines, Jeff. That's right. I spent a couple of summers in the mines when I was studying engineering. And I think you're our candidate to contact Mr. Clifton. Good. You'll have to work alongside him without him suspecting your plant. I see. 
Have you any opinions on the case? Yes. The neighbors said they heard an explosion and saw a flash of flame in the kitchen. Mary Clifton cooked on a gas stove. That's right. And if her husband did it, he could have opened the gas jet in the oven... Attach the slow fuse, like they used for a blowout in the mines, lit the fuse, going out the back door, and reached the bar before the explosion. That sounds reasonable. And as for how he actually killed his wife, the neighbors heard no pistol shot. And even a half-charred body should have showed some trace of a stab wound, which hers didn't. I know. But it would have shown no trace of finger marks if he choked her. That's how I think he did it. If he did it. And I'm ready to start right now for Ridgewood to find out. I've already telephoned the superintendent of the mine. You'll be working with Clifton starting tomorrow. Right. What are you drinking, fella? Beer. New here, ain't you? Yeah, just came in this afternoon. Signed up yet? Yeah, start tomorrow. Here you are. Thanks. I'm supposed to work with a cutter named Clifton. You know him? Yeah. Yeah, I know him all right. What's he like? Well, you can size him up for yourself. He's coming in now. Oh. Give me a boiler maker, Sam. Your name Clifton? Yeah, what about it? My name's Jefferson. Come on, shove it out, Sam. I, uh, I said my name's Jefferson. Yeah, I heard you. I thought maybe you might like to know who's working with you. What do you mean? I'll be loading in your room starting tomorrow. What's the matter with the two working there now? One of them is switching shifts. Yeah? Yeah. You don't look like any miner to me. Give me another one, Sam. Right. That was too bad about your wife, Clifton. I just heard about it this afternoon. Never mind about that. You don't mind a guy saying he's sorry? I mind anything you say. <laughs> you act like I'm accusing you of something. What do you mean? Well, nothing in particular. It's just... A... All right, drink your beer and shut up. Okay. There you are, Sam. Thanks. Uh, Jefferson. Yeah? Now, get this. You're working with me. Okay, I can't do anything about that. But from the time we get in that cage tomorrow and start down the shaft until we quit and come out, don't bother me with talk. Understand? All right, monkeys, let's get in the cage and get down to midnight. Okay, let's go. Since we're first on, we must be working the same level. That's right. You knew? Yeah, just come on. Name's Jefferson. I'm Hinton. What drift you working? Don't know yet. But I'm working with Clifton over there. Oh, that's number three. You're working in a small head. Tight fit and dead end, huh? Yeah. Jefferson. Yeah? I want to ask you something. I thought we weren't talking, Clifton. Where do you come from? Still don't think I'm a miner. I said, where did you come from? Carter Mine in Kentucky. Oh, soft stuff, huh? Trying to do, trip me. What do you mean? Carter's hard, same as here. That passed me okay? All right, come on, let us out. This is our train here, Jefferson. Come on. Okay. Low seam, you better bend down. Right. Okay, let's go. What's the idea of stopping? Ground fall blocking the track ahead. Well, you can't prop up a roof with a toothpick and expect it to hold. Well, you can get around the fall on foot, all right. All right, all right. All right, you go back on the train, Hidden. Get a crew to come clean this stuff out, put in some real props, and wet the dust down. Right. Come on, Jefferson. Okay. <coughs> Can't take the dust? 
I'm not complaining. A few more yards, we'll be in the head and you can straighten up. Okay. This is our happy home and we don't make money standing still. You don't mean you're going to start cutting before they wet down. Why not? It's a cloud of dust. Suppose you hit gas. Some dust ain't combustible. Well, you know this kind isn't. I hit some gas the other day in a dust cloud and nothing happened. Well, maybe it wasn't inflammable gas. Oh, a book miner, huh? Well, just cautious. Time is money. I'm going to start cutting. <laughs> It's a fire damp. Let's get out of here. We'll never make it before it hits the dust. I said let's get out of here. As you will learn from tonight's case, which will reopen in just a moment, training, the right kind of training, has plenty to do with security. This week at the Equitable Society, I learned something about training. The president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, Thomas I. Parkinson, told me about it. You know, he said that the FBI operates a school for law enforcement officers called the FBI National Academy. Policemen from all over the country attend its classes in modern crime detection and advanced police work of all kinds. Down there recently, I was astonished to find how closely this FBI school parallels our own Equitable Society schools and training courses, and for the same purposes, too. Protection and security. Yes, representatives of the Equitable Society are always going to school. Classes run steadily at the Equitable Society, and special courses of instruction are given to Equitable Society representatives throughout the country as field training instructors constantly bring new information to Equitable field men everywhere. That's why the Equitable Society representative in your community is so well-versed in the things that are closely tied in with life insurance. Things like trusteeships, tax problems, mortgages, partnership agreements. And let me tell you that because many factors such as taxes are constantly changing, equitable society representatives must be progressive, must be forward-looking. So we can always say that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the equitable society has been building security for you your home, and your country. And now, back to the FBI file, The Cautious Killer. The courage of Special Agent Jefferson of your FBI in risking the danger of a coal mine explosion to carry out his duty as a law enforcement officer. That kind of courage was not peculiar to him. Rather, it is exemplary of the courage of all law enforcement officers who daily risk their lives in the performance of their sworn and sacred duty. The protection of the lives and property of you, the American citizen. At the first sound of the distress signal at the Ridgewood Mine, Superintendent Miller and agent in charge leads of the FBI rushed to the shaft head. Miller personally took charge of the rescue party, which is now making its way deep into the scene where the explosion occurred. Think there's any possible chance that they're alive, Mr. Miller? Well, if they are alive, Mr. Leeds, they're sealed up in a small head, and that's pretty bad. Even if the force of the explosion knocked out the gas fire before it burned up what oxygen was in the head... Well, there couldn't be too much left for them to breathe. I see. Here's where the fall begins, Mr. Miller. All right, men. Wet it down. How far is it to where they are? Oh, I should say about 20 or 25 feet. And that's many a ton of coal. How long would it take to reach the head? If they're alive, we can't wait that long. 
We'll clear out about half and then try to drive an air shaft through before we go any farther. I see. All right, that's enough, men. Now dig it away and keep it wet as you go. And I don't need to tell you to work fast. Passed out for a minute. <coughs> yeah. You got any room over there? Not much. Jefferson. I wonder how bad off we are. I don't know. That depends on how much fell between here and the main shaft. I know, I know. At least the explosion snuffed out the fire. We still got a little stuff to breathe. Talking burns it up faster. <laughs> you mean, why don't I shut up? Yeah. <coughs> hey, Clifton. What is it? It's just... <coughs> it's just one trouble with this keeping quiet. It starts a fella thinking... In a spot like this... When you don't know if you'll come out of it or not... Well... Well, what? Well, you just start thinking of all the bad things you did. You know what I mean? No. You mean you never did anything you're sorry for? Well, keep quiet, will you? No, I just asked Shut you. up. Shut up. Shut up. Okay. I'll keep quiet. Let's both keep quiet and think. Haven't the men dug through halfway yet, Mr. Miller? No, we've only made about ten feet. But it's been a couple of hours now. Yes, I know, I know, but we're not getting through as fast as I'd hoped. You think they could still be alive? If they were alive when we started, there's a chance. Just a chance. But I'm not going to wait any longer. What do you mean? All right, stop work, men. I'm going to see if they can hear us. Clifton! Clifton! Jefferson! Clifton! Jefferson, can you hear us? Clifton! Oh. All right, men. Bring up that shaft. All right. We're going to try to drive through them right now. Come on, hurry up with the shaft. Coming up. All right, now, start driving. And remember, if they're still alive, every second counts. Jefferson. Jefferson. Yeah? I I changed my mind. Let's talk. Did the thinking get a little rough? Just let's let's talk. Okay. Got a subject? Yeah. Getting out of here. How? There should be a rescue party digging through to us. Yeah, that could take days. Yeah. That ended that subject. Got another one? No. I'll throw one in. What? Women. I'm not interested. Why? Just not interested. On account of your wife, Clifton? What do you mean? What happened to her? What are you talking about? Why did you do it, Clifton? Do what? You thought she was in love with somebody else, didn't you? What are you talking about? You were insanely jealous, weren't you? I said, what are you talking about? Look, 
Why don't you get it off your conscience? I don't know what you mean. Your wife wasn't in love with Jim Monroe. That's a lie she was. You just thought she was. That's why you choked her to death. She said she was leaving. That's why you choked her to death. She was going away with him, I know it. That's why you choked her to death and set fire to the house. Yes, yes. You did kill her, didn't you? Yes. You did kill her, didn't you? Yes. I killed her. I killed her. Listen. What? They're coming through to us, Clifton. What? Get hold of yourself now, Clifton. This part of your troubles are almost over. What do you mean? It's just like you said in the bar yesterday. I'm not a real miner. What? I work for the FBI. <laughs> John Clifton was returned to Ohio, where he was tried and convicted for the murder of his wife. Yes, a crime of passion is seldom a professional crime, and its final solution may rest solely on getting a confession of guilt from the suspect. And although many arduous and sometimes dangerous steps may lie between the crime and the confession, victory for the hunter over the hunted is inevitable. For well, there's always a limit to the capacity of the hunted to endure. Next week, you'll hear a particularly exciting case from your FBI file. Before telling you about it, a word about one of your neighbors. Just as you look to your FBI for national security, so to the Equitable Society you look for the financial security of life insurance. Yes, like the FBI agent, the Equitable Society representative in your community is a specialist on the subject of security. His job is to preserve homes, to help keep children in school, and to make old age a time of happiness and contentment. It's a good job and one that has won for him the respect and confidence of his fellow citizens, who recognize his contribution to the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Corrupt City. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlson. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. Now I should like to read a statement from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The observance of Boy Scout Week should command the attention of the entire nation. At a time when our country is suffering from the ravages of youthful crime, the spirit of the Boy Scouts of America is doing much to influence the future thought not only of our nation, but the world. During this period of readjustment, there is a definite need for honor among men. The Boy Scouts theme for this year is Scouts of the World, 
building together. All of us might very well adopt this theme. If we do, I am sure the family of nations will enjoy peace instead of war, truth instead of false ideology. The keynote of scouting is good citizenship. A scout promises on his honor to do his duty to God, his country, and to help other people at all times. This is America at its best. Friday nights, there are great programs on ABC. Next comes Fun with Alan Young and his guest, Rita Hayworth. Don't miss this laugh-packed show. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before opening tonight's FBI file, let's consider the slogan, E Pluribus Unum that appears on every United States coin. It means one from many. In other words, get together, stay united. A perfect example is the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. In the Equitable Society, three and a quarter million Americans have united for security, have pooled their dollars to give each individual member far more financial security than he could achieve by his own unaided efforts. These equitable society dollars are invested for the benefit of its members and to promote the industrial and financial health of the entire country so that by serving its members, the Equitable Life Assurance Society serves America. Tonight's FBI file, The Sinister Souvenir. of you men who are now wearing discharge buttons in your lapels, here is a message from your FBI. It's about those souvenirs you brought back home with you, the shooting kind. You know, that rifle or pistol or Tommy gun? Well, already scores and scores of these weapons have figured in serious crimes committed by other persons who got possession of them. A little later... We'll tell you how you can keep your war trophy from becoming an instrument of crime. But first, listen to the recent case of one returning vet and the crime that came out of his gear bag. Most of the fellows kissed the good old USA's terra firma the minute they got off the boat. But not PFC Joe Williams. He saved his kiss until he came up out of the subway and planted it smack on Flatbush Avenue, Brooklyn. A little while later, he planted another kiss on the cheek of his sister. Gosh, Joe. Hey. It's just so wonderful you're home. I'm you're home. home? Yeah, I'm home, baby. Oh, I'm so happy I don't know what to say. Well, I feel pretty good myself. Just let me look at you again. Okay. Oh, I... Oh. I've got to stop this. Let's get organized. You sit right down over there and I'll go fix you something now, to eat. Now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Food can wait. I've got some things to show you first. You have what? Presents, souvenirs, junk like that. I've got them right here in the bag. But you must be hungry, though. Hey, you just stay put. Here, now take a look at this. That's for you. Oh, Joe. Perfume. Yeah, that's genuine French perfume. Don't smell bad, either. Here, take a sniff. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Good, huh? And, and look, look, here's something for Eddie. One of those fancy Heidelberg Steins. Oh, that's beautiful, Joe. By the way, where is that husband of yours? Well, he's still sleeping. I'll call him now and tell him that you're no, here. No, 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 no. Don't bother. Here, look, take a look at the rest of this junk. All right. Souvenirs, souvenirs. Here, look. This here is a Nazi flag. Uh, it is? Yeah. Here's some Heine medals. Take a look at this. There's an honest-to-goodness German Luger. Oh, Ooh, that's a nasty-looking thing. Yeah, that's one of the sweetest automatics there is. I, I took it from the owner personally. 
How? Well, it's a long story. Hey! Hey! Oh, there's Eddie now. He's awake. Hey, where did you find Hi, Eddie. Huh? Oh. Hello, Joe. I was just going to call you, Eddie, and tell you that Joe was here, but I was so excited. Isn't this a wonderful surprise? Yeah. Welcome home, kid. Well, thanks, Hey, Eddie. where did you put my brown suit? It's in the hall closet. Eddie, you talk to Joe for a minute now. I want to go out and fix something to eat. Yeah, okay. Oh, Yeah. Well, uh, uh, you look good, kid. Thanks. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, but when did you, when'd you get here? Oh, I just got in a few minutes ago. Eh? Uh, yeah, well, what's all this stuff? Souvenirs, presents, junk, yeah. Oh, here's something for you, Eddie. Oh, for me? That... Oh, there, man, huh? Mm-hmm. Right from Heidelberg. Oh, thanks. Hey. Hey, yeah, what's with the gun? Oh, that's a uh, German Luger. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good-looking job. Where, where'd you get it? I took it off a guy. Yeah. Uh, look, you mind if I look at it? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, this is okay. Uh, Joe. Yeah? Look, I don't want to sound ungrateful, but could I maybe work a swap with you? Oh, what, what do you mean? This Luger instead of the beer mug? Oh, gee. Oh, I'd throw in a little cash on the side. What do you want with a gun? Well, just for a souvenir. What do you say? I'm afraid not, Eddie. Okay, kid. Come on, let's go in and eat. Is that you, Eddie? No, it's me, sis. Joe. Well, did you visit all the neighbors? Yeah, I saw a few of them. Weren't they surprised? Mm Mm-hmm. I purposely didn't tell any of them that you were home. I wanted them to be. Hey, I, yeah. Yeah? I got to talk to you. What about? Eddie. Well? Now, look, Peggy, I, I know this is none of my business, and if, if he wasn't married to you, I'd keep out of it, but what does the guy do? You mean his job? Yeah. He's a salesman. What does he sell? Lots of things. Well, I mean, what? What, for instance? Well, now, why do you want to know this, Joe? Well... For one thing, I was talking to some of the guys in the neighborhood today. From what they said, Eddie's mixed up with the wrong kind of people. Oh. You knew that, didn't you? Yeah. I had another reason for asking, too. You know that Luga I brought home with me? The gun? Mm-hmm. Eddie wanted it. He said he'd swap me the beer mug for it and give me some cash besides. Yeah, but you didn't give it to him. No, no, but I looked in my gear bag this morning. Yeah. The Luger is gone. Yes, the Luger is gone. But it is no longer a war trophy, a souvenir. It has gone to a darkened warehouse on the Brooklyn waterfront. There, in the hands of Joe's brother-in-law and a companion, the Luger has now become an instrument of crime. How many more boxes? This is the last of them here. Okay, let's get them out of the truck. Look, we've been here long enough. This will only take a couple of more minutes. Come on. Okay. Easy now. Wait a minute. Hmm? Listen. Probably the watchman. Dutch, Dutch. I told you we should have. Shut up. He's coming right at us. He's going to spot us. No, he ain't. <laughs> Mr. Forrest? Yes? My name is Hoke. This is Mr. Rogers. We're from the FBI. Uh, How do you do? Uh, The body of the watchman is in the main warehouse. Uh, Come with me, please. Surely. Any idea when the killing occurred? Not more than two hours ago. That's the last time the watchman checked in. I see. When he missed making his last report, we investigated. After finding the body, we immediately called you. Uh In here, please. All right. Go ahead, Jack. There he is, right over there. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go outside and wait for the coroner. Surely, Mr. Forrest. Okay, Jack, let's have a look at him. Okay. Drilled him right through the head. Yeah. 
Well, we better start looking for where that bullet lodged. Now, let's see. He was standing right here at the entrance of this row of narcotic packing cases. The bullet entered low on the forehead. Came out high in the back of his head. Hey, look, Larry, high up on that post there. Where? Oh, looks like a fresh chip. Yeah. Uh, come on, give me a hand with this ladder. Okay. Hold it here, now, That's good. All right. Now, hold it steady and I'll go up. Watch it. What'd you find, Jack? What we're looking for, all right. Good. If I don't break my knife digging it out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's got it. Okay, come on up. What's it look like? It's not big enough for a 38. Doesn't look like a 32 either. No. Well, let's not bother guessing. Let's see what other leads we can pick up and then get over to the lab. Somebody here to see Eddie. Who is it? He says he's your brother-in-law. What's he doing here? Tell him I'm busy. No, you can't be that busy, Eddie. Okay, kid, come on in. Wait outside, don't you? Okay. What's on your mind? Well, uh, Peg asked me to come here to your office. She was worried when you didn't come home last night. I was working. All night? Yeah, all night. Doing what, Eddie? What's that to you? Well, it's nothing to me, but well, Peg's my sister. Now let her ask the question. Look, Eddie, I talked to some guys in the neighborhood and they told me some things about you that didn't sound so good. Oh, yeah? Like what? Well, that you were mixed up with the wrong kind of guys. What is this? Are you trying to pin something on me? No, I just want to find out if it's true. Of course it ain't true. Someone's trying to knife me, that's all. And there's one more thing. Well? That uh, German Luger I brought home with me. What about it? You wanted it. That's right. I looked for it yesterday. It was gone. Now, wait a minute. Are you trying to say I took that gun? Eddie, all I know is it's gone. Have you told all this to Peg? Yes. Oh, that's great. That puts me in a terrible spot. Now, look, could you go on home? Tell Peg I'll be home for dinner. Then the three of us can sit down and straighten this out. Okay? lab report on that bullet check yet, Larry? No, but they had to call any minute. Looks like that's going to be our best clue. Why, Jack? What about those fingerprints we got off the windowsill where the thieves came in? They were the night watchmen's. Well, that's that. Targeted. Hope speaking. Oh, it's the lab. Oh. Yes. Yes, all right. Uh -huh. I'll send over the complete report, will you please? Thanks. What's the verdict, Larry? Caliber of that bullet was 7.65. Millimeters. That's right. It was fired from a German Luger. Peg. Peg. She isn't here, Eddie. Huh? Oh. Hi, kid. I say Peg went out. Well, didn't you tell her I was coming home for supper? Yeah, yeah, I told her. Where'd she go? See the doctor. Doc? What for? Well, looks like you're going to become a father. No kidding. Eddie, have you seen today's paper? Why? There's a story in it about a holdup in a government warehouse. Yeah? The watchman in the warehouse was killed. So what? Well, let me read you something. Yeah. The bullet which killed the watchman was found lodged in a wooden support. The FBI laboratory positively identified it as having been fired from a German Luger. What are you telling me for? When I was in your office today, I saw some boxes, Eddie. Boxes with government stencils on them. Well, who are you driving at? I know now what happened to my Luger. Now, look. Kid. You did that job, Eddie. You did it with my gun. You're crazy. Where's the gun? I don't know what you're talking about. Turn around. Keep away from me. Yeah, there's a bulge over your hip. I want to find there out. There we are. I was right. Yeah, wise guy. This is your gun pointing right at you. Let me have it, Eddie. What? I want the gun. Keep away, kid. I said I want the gun. Okay. Oh. So long, sucker. Don't 
Tonight's FBI file on the sinister souvenir will reopen in just a moment. Meanwhile, perhaps you'll be surprised, as I was, to learn that there is more than one kind of security. This week, at the Equitable Society, I got a brand new slant on the subject of security from Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Society. Did it ever occur to you, Mr. Parkinson said to me, that there's such a thing as having too much security? Well, how could that be, I asked. Well, Mr. Parkinson said, a convict in jail serving a life sentence has perfect security. His clothes, food, and shelter are assured for the rest of his life. But who wants that kind of security bought at the price of freedom? Of course, that's an extreme case, President Parkinson went on, but don't forget that the oldest trick of all dictatorial governments, from Julius Caesar to Adolf Hitler, was to promise the people bread and circuses and security, and then take away their liberty. Mr. Parkinson paused for a moment, and when he continued, there was a note of deep conviction in his voice as he said... That's one reason why all of us in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States are glad that Americans believe in life insurance. Equitable Society members do not pay for their security with lost freedom. Life insurance security is the result of individual thrift and forethought, of initiative and self-reliance. And a man with life insurance is pretty sure to turn a deaf ear to the glib promises of demagogues and agitators. Yes, we're proud to say that this week, and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security, the right kind of security, for you, your home, and your country. And now, back to the FBI file on the Sinister Souvenir. Of course, no returning veteran expects that the pistol or Tommy gun or other lethal weapon which he brings home as a war trophy shall ever become an instrument of crime. Joe Williams certainly didn't expect that to happen to his German Luger automatic. But two nights after he got home, one man had been murdered with it, and next day he himself was shot with it. A few minutes after the brutal shooting of Joe Williams, his sister returned to the apartment. Finding him on the floor, she called the doctor, then worked feverishly to bring him back to consciousness. Here, darling, drink this water. Thanks. No, don't move, Joe. I'll lift your head. Okay. That's fine. That's fine, darling. I bandaged the wound and checked the bleeding. The doctor will be right over. Uh-huh. Joe, what happened? Uh, it was an accident. I shot myself. That's not true. Honest, Peg. Yeah, then where's the gun? Well, it's... Look, I've got a pretty good idea what really happened. Eddie did this to you. No, Peg. Joe, I saw him run out of the building here as I was coming down the street. I called out to him, and he just kept right on going. Now, you tell me the truth, Joe. Okay. It was Eddie. Why'd he do it? Why? He did take my gun. He used it in the holdup. He killed a man. Oh. I tried to take the gun back. He shot me with it. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, sis. Joe? Joe, we got to call the police. No, don't. Joe, he killed a man. He's gone. He won't be back. Look, you're going to keep out of this. What about the doctor? He's going to know that something was wrong. We'll, we'll, we'll tell him it was an accident. Look, sis, you're going to have a baby. Let's do this for the kid, huh? Right number, Jack? Yep. Yeah? Good afternoon. We're special agents of the FBI. The FBI? Yes. We learned about your brother's accident. May we come in and talk to him? Well, uh, uh, yes, I guess so. Thank you. Go ahead, Jack. Go ahead. This way, please. Thanks. Who's the company, sis? These men are uh, 
special agents of the FBI, Joe. Well, what do you want? Well, Joe, we thought you might be interested in something we found out about the bullet that the doctor dug out of your shoulder. How did you know about it? Our doctors have to report these cases to the police, you know. That's how we got hold of the bullet. Well, what about it? Well, under our microscopes in the laboratory, it exactly matches the one that killed the night watchman last night. We'd like to see your German Luger, Joe. I, uh, I, I haven't got it. We know you didn't kill the night watchman. Uh, yeah, I say, I, I haven't got the gun. See, Did your husband take it with him, Mrs. Oakland? You know. Yes. We've checked everybody in your house since we found out about the bullet. Sis didn't know the truth about Eddie. We're sure of that. You see, she wanted to spill everything right away, but I kept her from it on account of... I kind of... Yes, we even know about the baby, too. What we want to know now is where is Eddie Oakland? I wish we could tell you. We need a good description of him. The police knew him, of course, but nobody has a photo of him. I can furnish that. Oh, good. Jack. Yeah? I'll stay here and get a full interview on everything. You go back to the office, get out an alarm on Oakland. I'll meet you there. Right. How have you been doing, Jack? No results from the alarm yet. How did you make out? Very well. What did you get? Oakland's wife told me about an office he had. I went over to the place, found some of the goods stolen from the warehouse. Well. I also found a man there. I've had him booked as a suspect. Could he tell you where Oakland was? No, but he's being questioned now. I've put out an alarm on his car. Oh, you'll probably stay out of that. It's too hot. I'll get it. Hope speaking. Oh, hello, Howard. What? Yes, yes, Wonderful. Good work. We'll get on it pronto. Thanks. Got something? Oakland's on the Commodore, headed for Chicago. Really? At least Howard turned up a ticket seller who sold Oakland space on it. Which section? The second. Let's see. It's midnight now. The train hasn't gotten to Buffalo yet. Let's get the Buffalo office on the phone. anything else, Joe? No, thanks. But you didn't eat a thing. I wasn't hungry. Now, you know the doctor said you've got to eat. I know, I know what the doctor said. Look, sis, I'm getting out of bed tomorrow. Joe. I don't want you waiting on me like now, this. Joe, I've I don't... caused you enough trouble. What are you talking about? Well, if I hadn't brought that stinking gun into this house... That gun's got no bearing on what Eddie did. Well, it was my pistol that killed that watchman. Eddie killed the watchman. Oh, if I could only get my hands on him, I'd... do what, Peg? Look. Tell me, what would you do? Why, you dirty... Take it easy. Eddie, why Shut did Shut up you... and listen. I come back here for a couple of days until the heat cools off. Then I'll be on my way again. No, you can't stay here. Well, this is the safest place for me to be. I'm supposed to be on my way to Chicago. Can I help it if I'm smart? You're so smart, you've got the whole FBI looking for you. That's why I come back. The FBI will never think of looking for me here until after I'm gone. That is, uh, unless one of you tries to tell him something. In which case, there's plenty of bullets left in this Luger. Tell him where he can go, sis. Six me something to eat, Peg, and some hot jam. I said tell him where Shut he up, can go. Shut up, girl, before I... Daddy, don't. I'll get you something to eat. Swell. Oh, and look. Nobody's leaving this house until after I do. Understand? <laughs> Larry, the Commodore left Buffalo 30 minutes ago. We ought to hear something. Well, maybe it was late. Maybe so, but... Okay. Home speaking. Yes. Oh, it's Buffalo now. Good. Hello, yes. What? Uh -huh. Yeah, I see. Pull the old gag, huh? Well, thanks anyway. So long. What happened? The man riding in Oakland's space wasn't Oakland. Pulled the old trick, book space, then turned it over to a hotel porter to sell to somebody else. Oakland's trying to be foxy, huh? Well, Jack, there's another part that usually goes with that particular piece of foxiness. What do you mean? Come on. I believe I'll get to show you what I mean. Good. I hope it chokes you. Thanks. Any more jabber there, Peg? Yeah. Pour me some. Let him pour his own. I didn't do a very good job on you, did I? Just swinging you in the shoulder. 
Maybe I can make up for it before I leave. What do you mean by that? Just trying to make him behave himself, that's all. That gun makes you a real big guy. I'm a big guy without it. Yeah, as long as I'm in bed, you are. Ed, will you tell us... Where did she go? Well, you wanted more coffee, didn't you? She had coffee right here. Well, maybe she went to make some fresh. Maybe she went to do something else, too, like getting on that phone. Leave her alone. Oh, no. Beck, what are you doing? Operator, hurry, please. Get away from that phone. Hang up, I said. <laughs> Told you not to do that. <laughs> get back in there. Take your hands off her. Joe, get back to bed. I'm going to fix this guy right now. Look, kid, I don't want to blast you again. Keep away, I'm warning you. Eddie, don't. Drop that gun, Oakland, and uh, don't turn around. The FBI. Ah, oh, you see what I meant, Jack? If he was dumb enough to pull the old railroad gag, then he had to pull the rest of the act, too. Try to hide out at home. All right, Oakland. Come on. Eddie Oakland and his accomplice were tried for the murder of the warehouse watchman. They were convicted on the charge of first-degree murder. As for Joe Williams, his war trophy, the German Luger, was returned to him. But after it had been rendered harmless by experts of the FBI. And that brings us to the final part of your FBI's message to you returned veterans who have brought back firearm souvenirs from the battlefield. No one wants you to give them up. You earned the right to keep them. Earned it the hard way. But please, for your sake, for the sake of your loved ones, and for the sake of society, have a firearms expert render your gun harmless. Do this now. Do it now without delay. And you can be certain that your souvenir will always remain just that and never become an instrument of a crime. Next week, you will hear another thrilling case from the files of the FBI. Before telling you about it, here's a brief but important message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To the FBI, America looks for national security. And to the Equitable Society, three and a quarter million Americans look for the financial security of life insurance. These three and a quarter million people comprise the Equitable Society. Because, you see, the moment they purchased life insurance through an Equitable Society representative, they became members of this great mutual organization. Remember, like your FBI, the Equitable Life Assurance Society representative in your community is constantly working for the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Cautious Killer. The incident used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before opening tonight's file, let's give a few moments' thought to a frequently asked question. Since these programs began almost a year ago, a number of people have written to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States asking how they could become members of the Equitable Society. They agree with the aims of the Society and want to know what they have to do to join. Well, of course, the answer is very simple. When you take out life insurance with the Equitable Society, you automatically become a member of the Society. You become part of a great cooperative enterprise that is run entirely for the benefit of its members. Yes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is a voluntary association of men and women who have joined together for security, who, because they have banded together, are able to assure each individual member greater security than he could attain by his own unaided efforts. Tonight's FBI file, The Corrupt City. Which of these two, standing before the Supreme Court of Public Opinion, would merit the severer judgment, the greater moral condemnation? The professional criminal whose business is violating the law for profit, or he who occupies a position of public trust and uses its power to protect the criminal for self-gain? It is eloquent testimony of the worthiness of a system of free elections that there is in America a minimum of corruption in public office. It is proof of the essential integrity of the overwhelming majority of those who seek office. Proof also of the conscientiousness of the people in selecting their public servants. And as demonstrated in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, it is proof of the uncompromising devotion of America's law enforcement officers to their sacred duty to uphold the law against all transgressors, no matter who they may be. In a Midwestern city along the waterfront, Midnight darkness and a light fog shroud the deserted docks and warehouses. A little while ago, a man standing in the deeper shadows behind a bale of cargo heard a large powerboat idle its motors and watched it drift in against the pier. Two of its crew clambered onto the pier, passed several heavy crates to those on board, and then... How many more cases, Mike? That's all of them. Okay, get aboard and let's shove off. The man in the shadows snaps on a flashlight and steps swiftly out along the pier. Just a minute there. Huh? Stay where you are. Who are you? This badge will tell you who I am. Oh. Cop, huh? That's right. Do you have authority to move those cases of cargo? Sure. Why? Because there's been quite a lot of cargo moved from piers lately without any authority. Hop aboard, Mike. Wait a minute. I want to see your papers authorizing movement to those cases. Mike, hop aboard. Let me straighten this copper out first. Well, go ahead, stupid. We're pulling out of here. Stop that boat! Looks like you missed them, copper. So you'd better arrest me. Did 
You want to see me, Chief? Yes, come in, Donovan. Donovan? Yes, sir? If I were asked what I think of you and your work, I'd say you're one of the most promising young men on the force. Oh, thank you, sir. And the thing that really sold me on your earnestness about your work was last fall when you asked for a leave so you could attend the FBI's National Academy. And at your own expense, too. And that diploma you came back with, well, I guess I was almost as proud of it as you were. Thanks, Chief. You have a great future ahead of you as a law enforcement officer. If you can stand the test of hard knocks. Well, I... uh... They can come in a million forms. Sometimes they're hard enough to break a man's spirit completely. If it's not strong enough to take it. Yes, sir. Personally, I want to commend you, Donovan, for the arrest you made two nights ago at Pier 26. Thank you, sir, but I... I read your report. I think you're on the right track. And somehow that gang of river thieves has got to be broken up. I bungled the job the other night by getting only one, but I'll get the rest of them, sir. The man you arrested was released this morning. I'll get... What did you say, sir? Mike Haynes was released this morning. Released? But, but... And here is your first test in the school of hard knocks, Donovan. A statement from the councilman in charge of our appropriation. You may read it all later, but I'll read only the last paragraph. Okay, sir. Therefore, in view of the evidence furnished me by reliable authority, it is my conclusion that Detective Donovan acted wholly without cause and recklessly endangered the lives of the crew by unprovoked and unjustified use of his pistol. What? Therefore, I demand his transfer to another assignment, patrolling a beat, and his promotion canceled. That's a pretty sordid story, Donovan. Well, Mr. Craig, I didn't come here to the FBI office looking for sympathy. You don't have to tell us that. I don't blame the chief for not going to bat for me. His hands were tied. Apparently that goes for everybody on the force. Yes, I know. I don't know who the Mr. Big is who's running the show in this town, but... Well, whoever he is, there's one set of hands he can't tie. The FBI. That's right. But where's our angle in the case, Donovan? There has to be one or we can't touch it. Well, those goods were part of an interstate shipment. Where's your evidence? Well, the river is the state line, isn't it? Yes. Well, the rest of the gang got away in the boat the other night, and they headed for the other side of the river. But you don't know for sure that the boat went all the way. No. It could have turned and cut back to this side at a point farther up or downstream. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I guess I was just a little overeager to get you boys into the picture. Well, we may get into it yet. But until there's a definite federal violation... I'd suggest you keep your eyes open for anything on Mike Haynes. Watch where he goes, who his pals are. Maybe you'll stumble onto something. Yeah, something Mr. Big can't cover up. Yeah. It might be pretty risky business for you. I'll get on Haynes' trail starting tonight. Busy, Sam? No, no, no. Come on in. Yeah, got me sprung, huh? Yeah. I don't know why, though. What do you mean? That was a real stupid play, Mike. What? Playing the big shot for that copper. You acted like you had protection sticking out all over you. Well, that's the deal, ain't it? No, not for publication, sucker. They're still honest cops, you know. Well, how was I to know? The big guy didn't like it. Well, he sprung you this time, but from now on, take it easy. Something's got to be done about that cop. Why? He's been tailing me ever since I was sprung. I go in for a beer, and he comes in for a beer. I go in the bowling alley, and he comes in. I go home, and he walks by the house. Well, he hasn't tailed you across the river any time, has he? Uh, How could he? That's out of bounds for him. The guy's driving me crazy. Maybe that's what he wants to do. Huh? Figures you'll get too jumpy sometime and make the wrong kind of move. Oh, not me, Sam. We're not going to take a chance on that. What do you mean? You want to get that copper off your neck? Sure. And here's what you do. Tomorrow, as soon as you know... 
Can I see you a minute, Mr. Craig? Oh, come ahead, Donovan. Any evidence on a federal violation yet? No, but I've got a pretty uh, good idea how they operate now. They've got a legitimate front here in River City. What kind? It's a small river freight business. They don't do much. I watched it for three days. But it gives them a front just the same. Yeah, and license to operate any kind of boat they want to anywhere on the river. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Who's the company? It's Sam West, an ex-rum runner, but I'm pretty sure he's not Mr. Big. Where do they keep the stolen stuff? Across the river. You have proof? Well, I can prove that they go across the river. How do you know? I watched them with glasses last night in the moonlight. Oh? Uh-huh. It was clear, you see, and I, I could follow the boat all the way across to the pier line on the other side. Mm-hmm. And then it turned up upstream, and I lost it in the shadows. Were they carrying stolen merchandise? Well, I couldn't swear that, but... Well, at least we know two facts now. They steal merchandise, and they operate across the river. I'm going to send the Bureau headquarters a report on this, Donovan. But I'm afraid we can't move in yet. Okay, but I'll make you a bet, Craig. What's that? Before I finish my war of nerves against Mike Haynes, you will have something to move in on. Well, don't stick your neck out too far. (laughs) River City needs it. What are you drinking, mister? Well, maybe I'm not drinking. That's about all you can do in here. The sign outside says, uh bar and grill. Okay. How'd you like some nice grilled salami on graham crackers? That's what we got left. Thanks. You looking for somebody? Yeah, I, uh, I thought I saw a fella come in here just ahead of me. I guess I never seen him. Uh-huh. You got a back door? Yeah, it's out back. Thanks again. Looking for somebody, Copper? Yeah. Mike Haynes? That's right. He's right behind you. There you are, Mike. Now the guy don't bother you. We'll return to this FBI file in just a moment. In the meantime, since it's still only a few hours past Valentine's Day, let's consider a subject that's very close to every man's heart and every woman. This week at the Equitable Society, one of the representatives told me about a unique valentine which he helped prepare. The giver of this valentine was a young man who came home from the Navy just three months ago to marry his childhood sweetheart. It seems that this newly wedded husband made up a giant valentine complete with cupids, forget-me-nots, and all the customary fixings. And in the center of it all was a brand new life insurance policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Well, when you come to think of it, what better proof of his love can a husband give his wife than to provide her with the security of life insurance? You see, here in the Equitable Society, we're not just guardians of the dollars and cents sent in by our members. We're guardians of human hopes and human happiness. Our job is to keep home fires burning and to give boys and girls wider opportunities for education and advancement. Our mission is to help banish fear from the hearts of men, to save widows and elderly people from the humiliations of poverty, charity, and dependence. So is it any wonder that we of the Equitable Society are proud to call ourselves life insurance men and life insurance women, and that we're equally proud to say that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Corrupt City. Every day and night, 24 hours around the clock, 
your law enforcement officers risk their lives to keep their covenant with you, to protect your lives and property, and to uphold the sanctity of your laws. And many of them risk their lives in keeping that faith. It is nearly noon now, the second day after Officer Donovan walked into the trap set for him by Mike Haynes of the River Gang. Agent in charge Craig of the River City Office of the FBI is sitting at his desk with Special Agent Tom Farrell. I'll take it, Tom. Okay. Craig speaking. Oh, hello, Chief. What? Yeah, I was afraid of something like that. Where? Uh huh. I see. Well, I guess that puts it up to us now, Chief. And we're moving in on the case right away. Thank you, sir. And we'll keep in touch with you. Right. Trouble? Yes, that young policeman, Donovan. What about him? A farmer on the other side of the river found him in a ravine this morning. Five slugs in him, but he's still alive. He had to be kidnapped. Okay, what's our first move? Not much doubt about whose work it is. Want to round up the gang now? No. No, we've got to get the proof first. And we'd better start on that stolen goods angle. That might lead us to Mr. Big himself. Mr. Big could be that councilman. Why? He made the chief break Donovan, didn't he? Proving what? Well, in his memo, he referred to evidence furnished by a certain reliable authority. But he could be that certain authority, you know. Yes, it's possible. The chief of police might be mixed up with him. Oh, I doubt that. I'll bet my last cent the chief is honest. Chiefs of police are clean, Tom. They've got to be to get that far. Sometimes they've got to take a dirty order and like it and ask no questions in order to do a bigger job. Well, where do we start on this case? Well, let's watch their boats first and see if they'll lead us to a cache somewhere on the other side of the river. Okay. And then we'll figure out a way to get Mr. Big. Hi, Mr. Adams. Come in, Sam. You, uh, you want to see me? Yes. Okay, what's on your mind? That policeman. Who are you talking about? Donovan. Oh. Okay, so he was getting too nosy, so we got rid of him. Did I tell you to? I take protection from you, Adams, not orders. Really? Now, what are you squawking about Donovan for? He might have found his way all the way up to you, you know. I could have handled that. Are you kidding? It goes to the papers then, and you can't handle them. You may be the party boss, councilman, and run everything in this town, but you can't... Shut up. Now listen to me. Okay. You know what you've done by kidnapping Donovan? Shooting him, dumping him across the state line? What? That's not a local police case. That belongs to the FBI. Huh? You heard me. All right, but that ain't my worry. Protection's still your job, Adams. You can't fix the FBI. So what are you going to do? I'm going to give the orders from now on, or pull out. You and the boys lay low for a few days. No more jobs until I tell you. Understand? Put a head on that for you, mister? No, thanks. No, it goes better with the music when it's flat. A comedian. Tom. Yeah? Mike Haynes down the barways. Yeah. Wish we could take him in now. Don't worry, we'll get him. Looks like he's about ready to shove off. I imagine he'll head for home. Well, we've been watching them three days now. They haven't moved a boat. Yeah, they must have gotten orders to lay off for a while. Yeah. Come on. Let's get back to the office and plan our next course of action. What about Haynes? Let him get home by himself. We've got more important work to do right now. Sam. Yeah? I got a hot tip on something big, Sam. Big like what? Big like a big pile of dough. Oh, the boss said to lay off. Hey, he likes the cut he gets, don't he? Well, sure, but... Then he... he'll drop his teeth when he hears about this. What do you got? Big shipment of nylon. 
No kidding. Yeah, and at present prices, we ought to split a hundred grand. Oh, where is it? It's on Pier 42, waiting for it. Well, let me get Adams on the phone. No, I'll leave him out of it. We'll do it now and tell him afterwards. Suits me. It is nearly midnight on the river now, and a ferry boat crossing far upstream seems to be the only sign of life on the surface of the water. But three hours ago, shortly after dark, four small boats put out from the River City shore, deployed, and took up assigned positions. Three are now hidden in the shadows at widely separated points along the pier line on the far side of the river. The fourth, on this side, is hidden among the pilings under Pier 42. A man speaks into a portable radio transmitter. Hello? Hello? Agent in charge, Craig. Boat number one. Report, please. Over. Boat number two reporting. Standing by. Boat number three reporting. Standing by. Boat number four reporting. Standing by. I don't know how much longer we'll have to wait, men. Maybe the plan's not going to work at all. But we'll stick it out. It's got to work, Craig. Haynes fell for the tip anyway, I know. Agreed to cut me in. Maybe Sam West or Mr. Big put the nicks on it. Uh, time will tell. And it looks like time's beginning to tell a sad story, so I guess we would Craig, better... listen. Motorboat. Yeah. Making this way, too. Let's not give the boys a false alarm until we're sure it's the boat we're looking for. Uh, that, that's it, all right. It's cutting in this way. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Craig speaking. I think we're in. There's a boat heading in for this pier. Keep radio silence and stand by. Hello? Hello? Boat number two, come in. Boat number two reporting. They've loaded and pulled away. Headed across the river for your position. Number two reporting. They've turned upstream and headed your way, number three. Over. Boat number three reporting. They've passed my position and continuing upstream toward your position, number four. Over. They've had time to pass number four by now, Craig. What's happened, I wonder? Maybe we'll hear something in a minute. Don't want anything to go wrong now. Just one. Number four reporting. They've just put in under a warehouse 50 yards from my position. Good. What are your orders, Craig? Over. Stand by number four until we all reach your position. Then we'll move in. Number two and three, let's go. All right, boys. Set those cases down right there. Now put yours up on the table here, Mike. Okay. <clears throat> Break her open and let's see what we got. Right. <laughs> Adams is going to be real sorry he passed this one up. <coughs> yeah. Well, it's got to be worth a hundred grand. That's all for us. I wouldn't be too sure of that. Huh? Adams. Tried to pull one without me, didn't you? So? You pulled this job against my orders. So from now on, we never heard of each other. Understand? I hear you. And if you don't clear out of this county and stay out, I'll have you slammed in jail so far it'll take you 40 years to walk to the front gate. That's enough, Adams. Put down that gun. Oh, no. I said put down that gun. No dice. Not until I... Drop that gun, Wes. What? We're special agents of the FBI. You're all under arrest. Thank you, gentlemen. Save it, Adams. You're in this, too. Just a minute. I'd like to explain. Explain it to the people of River City. The people who trusted you. They'll want to hear it all, I'm sure. Put the handcuffs on a man. Right. And by the way, I think you all should know that Donovan is recovering rapidly and will be happy to testify at your trial. The vicious political influence of John Adams and his accomplices was broken up by their trial and conviction 
in a federal court. They were sentenced to long terms in a penitentiary. The significance of tonight's case can be best illustrated by a quote from an article written by J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, in this month's American magazine. In this article, Mr. Hoover stated, A great menace to successful law enforcement is the crooked politician or policeman who places the pork barrel above the welfare of society. These politicians either corrupt policemen or destroy their morale. I must say here and now that if we are to stem the rise of crime, we must take police and sheriffs, the first line of defense against terrorism, out of the hands of venal politicians. The police department must be placed, like so many municipal fire departments and school systems, in the control of a nonpartisan commission. It may be a hard job, particularly when a powerful political machine exists in a city, but it can be done if every decent citizen puts pressure on his local lawmakers. Before we tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, a word about a man worth knowing. To your FBI, you look for national security and to the Equitable Society for the Financial Security of Life Insurance. In the past 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has weathered four wars and seven major depressions. During that time... Over five and one-half billion dollars have been paid to policyholders and beneficiaries. This tower of strength, security, and stability is represented in your community by a man whom hundreds of your fellow citizens know as their good friend, the Equitable Society representative, who, like your FBI, is dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, revealing for the first time the inside story of South American espionage, the Pan-American Patriots. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. However, all other names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank, Speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. Friday nights, there are great programs on ABC. For a laughing good time, listen to the Alan Young Show with guest star Vera Vague, which follows next. This is the American Broadcasting Company.